to go home? We're moms. Why can't we just stay of course here? we have an why answer when our kids done? ask why, why for the thousandth time today. We're moms. Of course we can never finish a conversation. We're busy chasing our kids across the atrium! <laughs> We're Christian moms. Of course we'll single-handedly keep Hobby Lobby and Chick-fil-A in business. Of course caffeine is an essential part of our daily diet. Hold a second, baby. Of course we're gonna forget to text you back. We're moms. Of course we're gonna get upset if you yell at our kids, because we don't even do that. Of course we're gonna worry about our babies, even if they are all grown up and have babies of their own. Of course we're gonna say we don't need help cleaning, and then get mad that nobody helps us clean. We're Christian moms. Of course we're gonna bring our kids with us when we volunteer. Of course we're gonna reheat our coffee like seven times and still not drink it. Of course we don't only have to carry our own stuff. Mom! Mom! We have to carry everyone else's too. We're moms. Of course our kids appreciate our advice. It just might take them 30 years to realize it. Hi, welcome to The Compass Online. We're so glad you decided to join us in worship today. My name is Tina Cumby, and I'm the associate pastor of our Hensdale campus. And I've been a part of the Compass Church family for 10 years. And I'd like to take this time to wish all of our moms a very happy Mother's Day. Well, as my own kids have been getting older, I've become an empty nester, and I've had to be more intentional about building relationships with other people. And I've had to get creative in how I reach out to others. And one way I've done that, believe it or not, is through coffee. I love coffee, I'm an avid coffee drinker, and sometimes I even feel a little guilty about how many times a week I go to the coffee shop around the corner from my house. But I decided it could be an opportunity to reach out to the people that work in the coffee shop. The baristas, they know me on a first name basis. They know my car when I drive through the drive through and they know me so well, they know I'm gonna order the same iced latte with one pump of vanilla and I'm gonna ask for an extra glass of water. So they usually have that ready for me as soon as I pull in. Some of my own friends don't even know me that well. So I decided to get more intentional about spending time with them and not just grabbing and going with my coffee. I've gotten to know their names as well and just little bits about them. Well, two weeks ago, they actually announced they're going to close the coffee shop for several weeks for renovation. It was very sweet because the, the baristas, every time I go in, they're making sure that I know they're going to be closed. So I started praying for each of them, that God would bless them and that there'd somehow be an opportunity for them to know about him while this coffee shop is closed. So the next time I went through the drive-thru, I said to Pam, one of my favorite baristas, that I had heard about the closing and that I had been praying for them and she thanked me for praying. And I asked her what would happen to her and all the other workers while they were closed. Well, she shared that she's actually gonna be working at a coffee shop in downtown Wheaton. It's just a few blocks from the Compass Church in Wheaton. I shared with her that I work at the Compass, that it's just a few blocks away and that I would come and visit her. Well, she thanked me for praying and she said she was looking forward to seeing me again. Now this was just a little thing. It was just one way in my daily routine that I can try and reach others for Jesus and invite them to know Him. So who is someone in your daily routine that you could be praying for and maybe even introduce them to Jesus? Well, let's all be praying about that in the weeks to come. Well, in just a few moments, we're gonna jump into a message from our senior pastor, Jeff Griffin. But before we do that, I invite you to set aside any distractions and let's worship together.
to all the moms of the Compass Church. Moms, we love you. You have devoted yourselves sacrificially to our well-being. And on this day, we want to say thanks. A happy Mother's Day to all the moms at our South Naperville campus, all at Bolingbrook, Three Rivers, Naperville, Hinsdale, uh, Wheaton, and online moms, happy Mother's Day. And some of you are like, ah, is this Mother's Day? Hey, friends, not too late. You've been reminded here at church. And so go rush to the store and get mom something, would you? I got some examples here of things you may consider. For example, there's the classic card. You know, this has been done for a long time. Hallmark is counting on it. Write a few words expressing your affection. Or there's the candle. Ah, moms love candles. 
smells wonderful. You can help her light it and remember your love for her. Or what do we got here? Chocolate, ah, always a winner. Although, if mom's trying to watch her weight, this could get you in trouble, you be the judge. And then flowers, all moms love some flowers, so there's a classic. Gifts are a way that we try to convey our love to our moms. I need to tell you about Nick's gift to his mom. Recently, I heard about this expression of love, this gift that's off the charts. Are you ready? So Nick was 30 years old and living with his mom and dad, which is fairly typical, but this wasn't because Nick couldn't afford to live on his own. He just loved living with his parents. He loved his folks that much. But Nick was doing quite well financially. In fact, he owned a mortgage broker company and though only 30, was raking in the dough. And so he, he came up with an idea. He thought, all of these years, my parents have provided the home that we three live in. He goes, what if I provided the home that we three live in? And what if I provided my mom a home that is unlike any other home she's ever seen? Friends, Nick built the largest house in the history of the state of Illinois. No kidding, take a look. Friends, is this house incredible or what? In an interview with the Chicago Tribune, Nick revealed that he had grown up in his parents' home, which was only 1,200 square feet, which means you could fit 34 of his parents' house inside of his new place. Friends, this monster of a home has an indoor gymnasium, swimming pool outside, swimming pool inside, dancing room, dance floor, movie theater for 30 people, guest room, seven of them that have fireplaces and bathrooms for each guest room. It is unbelievable. Nothing says I love you, mom, like a 41,000 square foot mansion. Some of you moms are like, where's my house? You can take your flowers. Mom, remember, love is real, whether it's a small gift or a big one. We, we, we love you, mom. Well, friends, you may have noticed that this house looks to be still under construction. Good observation. As it turns out, more accurately, construction has come to a halt for 16 years. That's right, Nick began building this house for his parents and he back in 2007. Remember the 08 financial crisis? His insurance company profits came to a halt and with it, the construction of this house. Nick had to sell it to someone else and I'm told today you can buy it for pennies on the dollar. What do you think? You, you interested? Friends, this house, it's a trophy to broken dreams. Nick had this vision of, Mom, Dad, someday I'm going to get married and have my kids there. And things didn't work out as he had hoped. Things never work out as we had hoped. And wouldn't you know, Mother's Day seems to bring the pain of broken dreams, makes it real. On this day that's supposed to be all happy, yay, Mom! It is a yay, Mom. But it's also a day when we realize, ah, oh, I've got pain. Maybe uh, it's for the ladies who wanted to be a mom, but they haven't had that opportunity. Or people who have lost their mom or have a broken relationship with their mom. Maybe they've lost a child or have a broken relationship with a wayward child. There, there are so many ways that Mother's Day brings us in touch with the fact that the dream isn't working out like it was supposed to. Friends, let's talk about that. How do we process broken dreams? Is there a way for us to enter into reality and still find joy and passion for life in the midst of broken dreams? There is a way, and we're gonna learn about it from the Bible. 
specifically the story of a woman named Naomi. Friends, this woman named Naomi was living the dream. Well, let me describe it to you. We find in Ruth 1, 2, it says, the husband's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Killian. So what a family. You know, you've got this Naomi. She loves her husband. She loves her two boys. She's living in a wonderful town called Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a word that means house of bread. And so it was known as a place of plenty, of having lots of good crops. And so you can just imagine, she's just living the dream, loving life, so grateful that things are working out according to her plan. Doesn't stay that way. Never does. Life has a way of getting all messed up. Let me show you what happens. Verse 1, there was a famine in the land. And so the family went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Friends, this famine here is a little ironic that Bethlehem, the, the house of bread, has no bread in it. This famine was a time of financial crisis that was so severe that this family had to abandon the city they love, the nation they love, and go to an enemy nation, the, the nation of Moab. But they were desperate. You can imagine the fear and anxiety that this family must have felt if it caused them to pull up their roots and travel to such a treacherous place. So things are suddenly not going so smoothly. Believe it or not, it gets worse. Let me show you verse 3. Naomi's husband died, and she was left with her two sons. You know, this glorious marriage ends prematurely, and this man that she adored, her partner in life, was now gone. It gets worse, friends. Verse 4. After they had lived in Moab about 10 years, both of Naomi's sons died. Who knows if it was a sickness based on their foreign context or what, but these two young men, they were probably boys when they arrived in Moab, but 10 years later, they've become young men. In fact, they had married Moabite women, but they're both dead now. And this poor Naomi went from living the dream to now being poor, widow, without her sons. You know, if you were to come up to Naomi and say, Happy Mother's Day, Naomi, it wouldn't feel good. This day would have been a day of immense pain for this woman who has lost her family. Well, at this time, she decides to go back to Bethlehem. The conditions there have improved and she says, I just got to get out of this land that has robbed me of all that I love. And so in verse 8, we see that Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. You know, these daughters-in-law, I mean, they were connected to Naomi through the boys that are now gone. And so with them gone, she says, listen, you're Moabite. I'm going back to Bethlehem. You go back to your homes of origin. And then uh, verse 13, uh, she says, I grieve for you, speaking to the daughters-in-law, that, that the Lord has punished me in a way that injures you. Wow, that's interesting. When she looks at all of her misfortune, she believes that God is punishing me. There's no way to explain this other than God is just making me miserable. Now, their losses, she doesn't see that as God punishing them. She's saying God has punished me in a way that injures you. She believes that God's just out for her. And sadly, God being out for her, God took her sons and so they lost their husbands. Fascinating. Getting into the mind of 
Naomi. She's convinced God is doing her wrong. It's interesting. One of the daughter-in-laws goes home, but one of the daughter-in-laws, the one named Ruth, the one whose name carries the name of the book, she says, I, I don't want to go. I want to go. If you're going to Bethlehem, I want to go with you, which is a little odd. Again, Ruth is a Moabite, and she doesn't have her husband anymore. And so the person that connected her to Naomi being gone, you'd expect her to agree and go back home. But she says, no, Naomi, I love you. You're my mother-in-law. I want to go with you. It's actually a beautiful passage. Can I read it? Verse 16 and 17. Ruth says, don't urge me to leave you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will now be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. In fact, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. Wow. This Ruth is devoted to Naomi. And Naomi's like, wow, that was a speech that I, I just can't even argue with. If you're that set on it, then fine. Come with me back to Bethlehem. So Naomi and daughter-in-law Ruth walk their way to Bethlehem. And imagine the scene, you know, Naomi hasn't seen Bethlehem in 10 years. The people of Bethlehem haven't seen her in 10 years. And they were delighted when they saw this woman that they missed Probably curious, like, where's her husband? And where are her two sons? And who is this girl that's with her? Uh, they, they run up to her and they say, Naomi! And look what she says, verse 20. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara. I, I should clarify. Maybe your Bible has a little note that tells you at the bottom, what these names mean. Turns out Naomi means pleasant, but Mara means bitter. She wants to change her name from pleasant to bitter. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Wow. Friends, uh, the failure of her life to match her expectations has rotted her relationship with God. She is so mad at God and so messed up in her soul spiritually. And this can happen. Naomi's not the first one. It's very common for people to experience, you know, hopes that their life is going to go this way, but then their family is just so different from what they had hoped. And as the result of those broken dreams, they shake their fist at God, blaming him and being angry at him. That's what's happened in this woman. Uh, it, it's sad. In, in some ways, she's got selective understanding of sovereignty. Let me tell you what I mean. Sovereignty is this belief that God is in control. It's selective in that she believes God's in control when bad things happen to me, but I'm not going to say God's in control when good things happen to me. Well, you say, where do you see that? Let's go back and, and look at that one phrase. She said, I went away full, but the Lord brought me back empty. Oh, that's interesting. I went away full, I had a lot. She doesn't say the Lord made me full. No, she leaves the Lord out there. I went away full, but the Lord made me empty. Why doesn't she say the Lord made me full and then I became empty? Do you see what I'm pointing to? Uh, she understands God's or expects God's involvement in all the bad stuff, but doesn't give God credit for the good stuff. When in fact, it's the other way around. The Lord says, every good and perfect gift comes from him. That's out of James 1. God is behind, either directly or indirectly, all that's beautiful in our lives. But when it comes to the bad, sometimes that's God. Uh, the Lord does use discipline and allow hardship to come into our lives occasionally to grow us or mature us. 
But most of the time, bad stuff is the result of sin and rebellion. We, we live in a fallen world. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. It's just, it's busted because of human and angelic rebellion. And so we need to be careful that we don't presume, since my dreams were not brought about, God did this to me. Yeah. Not so. And Naomi, misunderstanding what God's doing and not doing, has led to her spiritual collapse. Well, friends, what does this tell us? So let me just give you a, a little something to think about. I've, I've heard it said that while we can't control what happens to us, we can control our response to what happens to us. In fact, our response is our responsibility. Do you ever think about that? Life is hard. Jesus said, trouble's going to come your way. Some of your dreams may come true. A lot of them, yeah, it's going to be a mess compared to what you were hoping for. How will you respond? It's up to us. We choose what we will think of God as it relates to the hardship we face. We choose how we will respond to God as it relates to the hardships we face. And sadly, Naomi is just in a mess. She spiritually is collapsing because of her disappointment. Let me just ask you, when you look at disappointment, are you Naomi, pleasant, God lover? Or are you Mara, bitter? I, I worship uh, at one of our campuses in the front row with a young man of 19. His name is JP. And he's got cerebral palsy. His condition leaves him physically limited, vocally limited. And yet he loves the Lord. And together he worships with me with passion. And I just look at him and I go, praise God. You know, it would be so easy for him to be bitter towards the Lord because of the hardships he faces. But he says, God is good. I, I don't know fully why this has happened to me, but God is good and I will worship him. He is responding, taking responsibility for his response. How will you? Well, you're like, this is a depressing story. There's some good news coming. Are you ready? So, Here's what happens. Uh, as uh, Naomi and Ruth have arrived now as poor homeless people back in Bethlehem, they are able to find food because of a curious law God had established back in the, in the days of Moses. Let me read the law. Leviticus 19.9 says, Don't harvest the grain along the edges of your fields. And don't pick up what the harvesters drop. Leave that for the poor. Isn't that interesting? You know, in harvesting a field, you could be meticulous and make sure that you get everything on the edge of the field. And if you drop some in the harvest, you can go back and you know, pick up by going back a second time. And God said, don't, don't be that precise. Be a little wasteful so that the poor can work the fields after you and find something to eat. Isn't that interesting? And that's exactly what uh, this Ruth does. She says to Naomi, hey, I'm young, I'm strong. Let me go out into the fields and see if I can't find something for us to eat. And after being gone for a whole day, she comes back. And uh, she's got a bag of barley. And she's thrilled. She's like, look what we've got. And... Uh, Naomi's like, that is impressive. Where did you get it? She said, I found this landowner who was so nice to me. He invited me to, you know, take as much grain as I can find left over in his field. In fact, he told his employees to be kind to me. He was so good to me. And Naomi said, what was this landowner's name? And she says, it was Boaz. As it turns out, Naomi's like, I know Boaz. My dead husband is related to Boaz. Boaz was his rich cousin. You bumped into Boaz? Is that coincidence or is that providence? Look at what Naomi says, verse 20 of chapter 2. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, 
He, that is God, has not stopped showing his kindness to us. She's saying, I was wrong. I thought God didn't love me. It wasn't going to be good to me. I didn't care. I had made assumptions about God's heart towards me that I now realize were wrong. I love how Eugene Peterson in the message, his paraphrase, he says that same verse this way. God hasn't walked out on us after all. I guess he still loves us in bad times as well as good. That's it. She had an epiphany. She had realized the spiritual folly, this per- spiraling down where she was thinking ill will towards the Lord because of her hardship. She goes, what was I doing? I was wrong. Well, the story goes on, and it's a great one. You should read it in Ruth, where this daughter-in-law, this young widow, marries this Boaz and has a baby by Boaz. And let me read to you what it says towards the end. This is Ruth 4, verse 14. This is when some women, Naomi with some women who are her friends, they come to see the baby that Ruth has just given birth to. Verse 14, the women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who's better than better to you than seven sons. <laughs> she has just given birth. What a verse. What wise perspective from these friends. They're like, hey, I know your story's been a hard one. You lost your husband, you lost your boys, but you've got a daughter-in-law who is so good to you. She loves you. She's better than seven sons. I don't know what that says about us sons and how much value we are, but these women say, I know she's not related to you by blood, and I know that it's a little weird being that the son of yours that was married to her is now gone, but boy, she's special. And now she's given birth to a son, a little baby boy. Look what happens next. Verse 16 Naomi took the baby and cuddled him, and she cared for him as if he were her own. Isn't that beautiful? It's a wonky family. This daughter-in-law is not even really a daughter-in-law in in some ways because the son that links him is gone, but she's still kind of a daughter-in-law. And this child that the daughter-in-law has has no biological relation to Naomi. But Naomi says, I still view this kid as a gift from you, Lord, and I'm going to treat him as if he's my own. You know, sometimes our families are goofy. Sometimes it's not what we had hoped or planned for, and yet God's in it. His grace is still seen. Friends, even in the most broken of situations, the goodness of God is there if you have eyes to see. And the glory of this story is that though Naomi had a real bad spiritual fall at first, God broke in, God pursued her and restored her faith in the goodness and love of God. And the story ends with her once again loving the Lord and loving life with a far more mature perspective. Let me uh, end with... uh, a little prop here. I wonder if you know what that is. It's got a little rubber ring around this knob. Maybe this will help. Did you ever play bumper pool? I grew up playing bumper pool. I had a friend who had a bumper pool table down in the basement. This is an obstacle in bumper pool. If you hit the ball this direction, well, this is in the way it's going to hit. And when it hits the bumper, what you'll find is that the ball changes direction. The obstacle will not let it continue in the planned direction. It goes one way or the other. Isn't that interesting? And when we have disappointments, It's like hitting a a bumper. We will go one way or the other. Either we'll go to God in our disappointment or we'll run away from God. Sadly, Naomi started running away from the Lord, started seeing her spiritual life uh, disintegrate. But God in his grace gave her a second chance and now she's running to the Lord. 
How will you respond? Your response is your responsibility. Jesus says, you will have trouble. How will you respond to the trouble that you have? How will you react to God when it comes to the disappointments in your life? My prayer for us each is that we will know hardships, disappointments, they're in the field of life. May God give us the help, the perspective, the faith to know that he's good. He loves us even when things go wrong. And may we bounce into his arms and hold him closer than we ever have before, knowing that in our pain we need him more than we've ever needed him before. Can I pray for you? Happy Mother's Day, mothers. And I pray that you celebrate all that's good as a gift from God. And that even in the disappointments, moms, you will find the help, the strength, and the love of God to help you through the hard parts of life. Let's pray. God, we thank you much for this story of Naomi. We, we can relate to her spiritual struggle. We all run that risk. But we celebrate that you turned her around and brought her back to a really good place with you. God, we, we recognize that our response is our responsibility. W would you help us respond well when life doesn't go well? God, would you help us, please? Don't let the evil one cause us to doubt your love, your goodness, your nearness. Help us cling all the tighter to you, even when the pain is very real. And God, may, may we draw closer to you with thanksgiving and the good. And may we draw closer to you with dependence and all that's bad. We need you, both in the good and bad. You are the love of our lives, the hope of our tomorrow. We pray this in Christ's name. Strange and tears are past. I'll say.
much for joining us today. Please take a moment to fill out a connection card to let us know you're here. And as always, thank you for your generosity in supporting the ministry of the Compass Church. Your generous giving allows us to help people find and follow God. Be sure to join us next week as we start a new sermon series, Elijah, Facing Our Fears. And to all the mothers out there, happy Mother's Day and take care.